Thank you guys for coming. Um, my role previously, previous jobs over the last 15 years, was to go into security operations centers, evaluate their maturity, evaluate their effectiveness, um, see what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. And what I've done is taken that history into my current role at Palo Alto Networks to kind of evaluate, here's what we need to be doing. Um, so that's what we're doing at, at Palo Alto, is trying to figure out what we should be doing next. And what I'm going to show with you, share with you today is my experience of large companies, small companies, um, companies that are new to SOC, companies that have been doing it for 15 years, things that are working and things that definitely aren't. And I'm not here to uh, poo-poo on anybody's uh, SOC, telling them that they're doing it wrong. But what I want to do is tell you about things that people are doing right so that we can all kind of elevate um, our effectiveness together. So let me find my clicker. So like I said, I've been in a bunch of socks. The first sock I ever walked into in my life, it, was, it had a man trap. So I don't know if you know what those are, but you walk into the door and you step on the scale and you shut the door behind you and then it weighs you and makes sure that you weigh the right amount and then you're allowed in or not. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. I thought this place is made of magic. Um, I sat down and they had you know, all the big screens on the side and I thought this place is amazing. And then you start to get into it and you're like, okay, this is actually harder than it looks. They don't have it all figured out. Um, since then, I've been in socks where, you know, there's the fancy snap glass. And I'm here to tell you that if they have that snap glass where it's, it, you, you can't see through it and then they turn on a switch and you can see through it from the EBC, um, those actually don't tell you that they're a better or worse sock. They just are expensive. Um, some other things, I've been in socks where it's just an open cube area. I've, had, I've seen socks where it's the network operations center people sitting right next to the security operations center people. Do not do that, please. We always want to separate the watchers from the doers. And even though we're, we're moving towards where we want these people to integrate and we want their processes to work together, we want them to be hand in hand, we do not want them sitting next to each other and influencing directly what each other are doing. So just a the, just the hint there, keep your knock and your sock separate, but talking a lot. Um, I've also seen where, you know, there was a closed-in room where people walked into the room and sat down for 15 minutes in the morning and checked their console and walked out, and that was their sock. So there's a bunch of different types of socks. I'm sure every different kind is represented here from very large to very small. Um, but that's kind of what we're working with these days, and we all need to be getting better at it. So how did we get here? I mean, socks kind of came around officially in about the 70s. Um, and at that point in time, it was really governments. Governments were the only people that needed a SOC, because who would attack just a, a citizen? Um, so that's where, you know, in the 70s, by the way, I, I got this off of an HP paper, but in the 70s, it was kind of governments, and it was about um, kind of like those nuisance attacks. But then we moved into kind of the second generation of SOC, and it became really those nuisances. So nuisances for businesses, it started becoming a bigger problem, but still the only people that had socks were those super Fortune 100 type companies, if, if even then. Then stage three, that's when we started, you know, living e-commerce. Everybody was on the internet, and so, you know, cybercrime started, uh, people started figuring out they can make money from it, and so what happens is the sock has to evolve to be able to account for that. So that's when we're seeing, stage three is where we're seeing a ton of financial groups really elevating their security operation centers. And then four. Four is 2007 to 2012, and that's when we're starting to see cyber warfare. You know, uh, Stuxnet existed before then, but that's when it was actually found. Um, so that evolves how your, how your SOC is actually working. You're no longer just intrusion detection, you're actually doing intrusion prevention, hopefully. Um, but you know, the, the tools are increasing, the number of tools that you have keep going up. And so that's stage four, or the fourth generation of SOC. Then this little thing happened, the target breach. So there's everything before target, and there's everything after target. And the reason is, is because target was the first time an executive got fired. So 
completely changed the game of a SOC. Now you say, well, I worked in a SOC, it really didn't change that much. It did, because it was the executives started to see they're responsible for these breaches. They're getting more involved. So you might have seen more money come into a SOC. You might have just seen more pressure and more oversight come into a SOC. But that's the difference between four and five. And I think today we're still in this stage five. I think some organizations are starting to get to a next generation. But right now, stage five. So you know we're, we're trying to use analytics. We're using Hunt. We, we're kind of using Hunt. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you know, we're starting to really get into the automation, really build it into um, our organizations, kind of. Some people doing better than others, but we'll, we'll get into that. So that's the layout of how we got to where we are. So I'm going to go through a couple things that I found. Number one, well, number one was the snap glass thing that I told you about. But this one, number one, naming makes no difference. So. Everybody's trying to come up with different names. Security Operations Center is, of course, the, the normal. Um, Cyber Defense Center is kind of a close second. People are coming up with security um, intelligence and operations centers. Uh, if you put de defense center in there, does it make it sound more interesting? If you put intelligence in there, does it make, it, make you sound more smart? Um, you can call it whatever you want. Fusion Center, I like Fusion Center because it's kind of the holistic, the business is coming together and um, it makes no effect no um, effect on the effectiveness of your SOC. So is anybody not called a SOC here? Do you call it one of these other names? Hands? Nobody's going to admit it. OK. Fine. Um, I do get asked about SOC 2.0. Well, what, what if I call it SOC? My, I have a SOC 2.0. OK. SOC 2.0 is misused everywhere. We, you know, we use it in marketing. We use it everywhere. Um, Originally, SOC 2.0 was defined by Forrester, and it's basically a virtualized SOC. So the idea is that you can automate the first line analyst. So the only thing left for a SOC to do is that advanced analytics, that advanced um, um, investigation of the incidents. And the theory is that those are specialized um, feature, specialized tool sets that a person has, and they can do that remotely. So you don't actually have a physical SOC. You have experts based around the world that are pulled in to do what they need to do. That's SOC 2.0. I've never seen anybody do it. So while it's great in theory, nobody is doing SOC 2.0, so don't buy into that. Um, so that's, that's the naming. Call it a SOC. That's fine. Number two, the mission matters. So one of the biggest things I see for SOCs that fail is that they're trying to take on too much, or they don't even know what they're supposed to be doing. So when I define a SOC, I say your analysts do three things. Identify, investigate, and mitigate threats. That's all they should be doing. And you say, no, 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 we have to do all these other things on the right. Your organization has to do all of these other things on the right. Your analysts do not. And the problem is, is if they start doing all of these things in the no column, their mission is going to be diluted. So that means they're not going to be effective at it. So you need to be able to define, here's what the SOC does, and here's what they don't do. All of these other things are necessary, so somebody has to do them, but not your analyst. So one thing that I've actually seen work for a SOC is they came up with their mission, they had their limited scope, and they actually came up with a service catalog. Here's the things that we are going to provide to you and kind of just give a little bit more of a definition of here's what we do and here's what we don't do. Um, an, another example of a terrible mission statement. Um, I worked with a SOC that they got requests from the business to say, I need this port open on the firewall. And the SOC would turn around and create a ticket for the engineers to do. I said, that's what you do? Yes, that's what, that's what our security operations center does. I'm like, no, no. So hopefully nobody in this room is in that position. But it was not a small company. It was a very established company. So Define your mission well. Um, limit the scope of what you're doing. Problem number three, or solution number three. We all have a people problem. We hear about this every day. We've lived it for a decade, two decades. I put a question mark on it, and I'll talk about why. One, we, we know we don't have enough people. 
we know that we're trying to train them in university. We're trying to make sure that we have the next generation to help us staff our security operations centers. It's not working. Um, I worked with a very large energy company in the United States, and they tried to create their own internal security university within their program, within their company. They were an energy company, and they built a security training program. They did it for two years. They spent a lot of money. They trained a lot of people that went to work for somebody else. So it doesn't, it doesn't always work. And, but but that's, that's the, the problem, right? We get, we get in people, we train them up, and now they've got the elevated skill set. They're like, oh, I'm going to go find more money working in a different place. The problem gets worse if you live in a place where there's even less resources. So if you are in Australia, there's only so many people that do security in Australia. You're going to have to ship them in. I mean, it's not hard to convince people, like myself, I love Australia, to move down there. Um, but you, you have a, not only a limited resource pool, but a limited area that you can draw people from. So that makes it worse. But I'd like to argue that it's not just a people problem. Like, we created this problem ourselves. We created this problem because, well, the attackers created the problem because now they're, now they're automated. So they can launch attacks. They just spin up botnets. They can rent them. Um, all of a sudden, we have too many events coming in. And what do we do? We say, we have to hire more people. That's our go-to. So we're creating that people problem, and that's not the right solution. The other thing is low fidelity data is overwhelming our socks. And so I don't even know how long ago now. When did SIMs come out? Over a decade ago. Everybody said, I want a SIM. Because what's going to happen is I'm going to take all my security data, I'm going to put it in one place, single pane of glass. It's all going to get correlated together. It's going to be simple. I've solved all my problems. I now have a SIM. Most people pull all that data in to their SIM and don't do anything with it. So now all they've done is congregated all of this data that they don't know what to do with. So then that also leads to more of the people problem. So that's what we need to solve. You say, how the heck do we do that? Well, we'll get there too. Um, one other note too on SIMS, number of feeds does not equal use cases. So a lot of times people will buy their SIM and they'll say, oh, I've got you know, 10 feeds coming into it. Woo that doesn't mean anything. If you don't have the right use cases built on it, then you're not really doing anything additional. So number of feeds does not equal actual effectiveness in your SOC. Keep that in mind. Does anybody know what this is? Nobody? Nobody? OK. This is a Turing machine. So during World War II, um, the Germans were using an Enigma machine to, um, to encrypt all their messages. We couldn't, the Americans, the Brits, couldn't figure out how to decrypt them fast enough. And the, pro the reason was is because they kept changing their cipher at a range that we had rooms full of people and couldn't figure out how to decipher them quick enough. So Alan Turing's like, oh, we need a machine to fight a machine. And this is exactly what we need today. We need machines to fight machines, not people to fight machines, because it's not working. We can't. We can't train enough people to handle it. We don't have rooms big enough for the amount of people that we need to fight these things. So we need machines to fight machines. So this is, a, this is a depiction of current. This is my view on how analysts spend their time. So analysts in a SOC spend almost all their time identifying stuff. Most of the time it's false positives. Most of the time it's noise. Most of the time they don't do anything with it besides ignore it. Um, again, feeds do not equal use cases. So they might have 20 feeds coming in, but if they're not doing anything with it, it's junk. Um, they're overwhelmed. You know, it's low fidelity data. They might uh, only see half of the picture because they're not using SSL decryption. It's just, it's just junk and they're wasting their time on it. So what do they do? They detune the sensors. They say, well, we're getting too much data in, so I'm just going to detune my sensors so I don't get as much data in. OK, that's one way to do it. That happens all the time. The other thing is they can just ignore alerts. So <laughs> the first sock that I walked into that I told you where I got into the man trap, I sat down next to an analyst, and we looked at a screen full of alerts. And I said, oh my gosh, that's, you know, there's, there's 20 of them there. There's only one of you. What are you going to do about it? He does a select all, delete. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you can't do that. Well, he just did. He's like, oh, those are probably all false positives anyway. And that's how he solved his problem. Like, okay, that's not what we can do. We can't, that's not what we do. Um, the other thing is if they do find problems, then they're gonna create a ticket for somebody else to solve. They're never gonna have a closed loop process. They're gonna see the same problem again. So it's kind of the how fast can we, can we close out issues without actually solving the problem. Maybe we need to upgrade an application. Maybe we need to upgrade a firewall. Whatever we need to do, let's do it instead of just trying to get people to do close tickets as fast as they can. And all of this just causes our people to burn out, which again leads to increase our people problem. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> now, do they really ignore events? Now besides my personal experience of the select all and, and delete, um, this was research done last year by ESG. I don't know if you guys can read it in the back. Does your organization ever have to ignore some security events alerts that you believe should be investigated further, but can't because it, you can't keep up with the overall volume? More than 50% said yes. I think the other 43% are lying to themselves, but over 50% acknowledge that, yeah, we ignore things because we just don't have time to deal with it. As a business, that's not what you want to hear. As practitioners, that we, we get this. This is our life. We need to change it. So one thing I've seen work. Um, people are moving towards prevention-based architectures. So instead of just detect and respond, detect and respond, detect and respond, we've heard it for you know, every sim vendor ever. I used to work for one. Um, we need to move back to actual protection before it comes in. I believe that if we can change the inputs and the outputs of a SOC, we can change what actually happens in a SOC. And so the prevention-based architecture is something that I've seen consistently working for organizations. So what does that mean? The first thing is consistent protection. So whether you're working net network, cloud, endpoint, um, you need to make sure that you have consistent protections against all of them, that they're all updated at the same time, because if you lock the front door but you leave the back door open, you're not helping yourself. So figuring out how to get that consistent protection. We used to think, well, that means, you know, I gotta buy two firewalls, I gotta buy two, I gotta, you know, if my first firewall doesn't catch it, my second firewall will. No, you just need to make sure that things are implemented properly and make sure that you have the consistent protections across your environment. So that's number one. Number two is centralized management. So centralized management, great, I only have to learn one tool, that seems like it'll make everything faster. Correct. It will also make things manageable. So if you have an update that you need to do, you can do it across your entire environment instead of onesie, twosie. You have to have this centralized management and to make sure that everything is updated at the same time because you don't want your Japan office to be behind and your Sydney office to be you know, three levels up from Japan or else they're gonna get into your network, you're gonna be in trouble anyway. So centralized management helps you with that. The third piece of prevention-based architecture is automated threat prevention. So I've been in numerous SOCs and I say, how do you guys handle threat intelligence? And they say, well, we, we subscribe to all these different feeds, it's overwhelming, there's too much. I said, well, okay, what do you do when you get this threat intelligence? How do you consume it? And they say, well, we get it in email, we read it, and then within a week or two, we press out, we push out some updates. We have our IOCs, we update those. A week or two, email, people problem. You get where I'm going with that. Not scalable, and then it takes a week or two to update. So there's automated threat prevention available in lots of different places. You just have to let it run. So what this means is that a threat comes in, an IOC comes in, and it automatically updates your controls, whether it be your endpoints, whether it be your firewalls, whether it be um, you know, your, your, your cloud access. You can get threat prevention in five minutes. Now, I'm not saying you're gonna get that for every threat, but if you can get it down to five minutes from two weeks, that's gonna make you better protected. So that's the third piece. And then the fourth piece is moving all of our prevention closer to the business. So closer to users, applications, data, services, we wanna make sure that we are protecting those things, not just the network, because who cares about the network if we can't protect 
the users and the apps and the data and the services. So that's kind of along the lines of zero trust, another topic that's going around. Um, so all that together is in prevention-based architectures. This is where we want to be. I've, the companies that I've seen do this so far are not small. They have a lot of money. They've put a lot of time into this. But I think that's how it always works, is that the bigger guys with the, with the budgets are going to be able to get there first. And then it can trickle down to some of the um, more medium-sized organizations. But what it's going to do is you're going to have that automation for consistency so that, again, your Japan office and your Sydney office are at the same levels. You're going to have better outcomes. The reason you're going to have better outcomes is because you're not spending all of your time tracing down false positives and nuisance data. You're actually going to have time to investigate. It's going to go faster. And the key is that you want machines to do what machines are good at. You want people to do what people are good at. So machines are good at events. Machines are good at pattern matching. People are good at situations. People are good at finding patterns that those machines can't. That's what we want them to work on, and that's where Investigate works. Ultimately, they'll have more job satisfaction. So we're taking away the, um, the overwhelming feeling of too much data, crappy data. We're giving them more job satisfaction. So hopefully, with all of these things, we're helping that people problem. I did want to note on the Mitigate section, there's a bunch of tools out there that will do automated remediation. EDR, XDR. I know of one company that has stood up and done it, that has turned it on. And this isn't probably in the past two months that I've kind of asked who's doing it. And I mean fully, so that an, an action or a, a incident comes in and they fully stand back and let it go, turn off the machine, pull it off the network, do whatever. Everyone else is scared for good reason. I mean, you don't want to go and turn off the CEO's laptop because it's infected. Well, you really want to, but you know, it could cause business impact. So a bunch of people use those tools to alert them, say this one should be taken off the network. Here's the next action. But there's not many that are willing to do that yet. I think that's going to change, hopefully, very, very quickly. So where else does this get us? This red part right here, this is hunting. This is where we all want to be. So who here does hunting? Nobody's raising their hands today for me. I got a couple hands. OK. Many, many companies say that they do hunting or they want to do hunting. Again, very few do or do it effectively. So what is hunting? Um, hunting is smart people looking for things that couldn't be found else by anything else. So this is smart people doing smart things. Not what machines do. Machines do what they do. This is smart people doing smart things. The people that are good at it, they take time to do it. And it's not just, OK, it's Friday afternoon. Here's two hours. Go figure something out. It is, here's two weeks. Your mission is to be a hunter for two weeks. It's going to be documented. We're going to have a process for it. Uh, we're going to meet every morning and do a, like a sprint uh, stand-up meeting to figure out what they've done. But it's going to be goal-oriented, process-driven. It's going to be driven by a piece of intelligence. So a lot of times it's, oh, I've heard of this new um, threat, and I want to know if I'm affected by it. Sometimes it's a review of blocked events. You go back through your firewalls, figure out what you've blocked, figure out why, figure out if you're under attack. Um, so always driven by a piece of intelligence. And then it ends with what we've learned. If you haven't learned anything, then your process is junk, and you need to go back and figure out a different process for hunting. This is the way we want it to be, and these are the companies that are successful with hunting. Those that are unsuccessful are those that say, here's two hours on a Friday, go find something. Um, they buy, they invest in a data scientist who doesn't know anything about security. So it's a good way to spend a lot of money. I've seen it done, I've done it. <laughs> Um, but that's, that's how it's not going to work. You need those security people. You need to give them enough education that they can go play in the data and find what they want. But they need to know what they're looking for. So that's how you make Hunt work. So given that, is anybody doing Hunt? 
Oh, okay. My next big heart attack, my, my issue. All right, in your security operations center, who uses less than 10 tools? And you have to raise your hand for one of these, so you're not getting out of it. Who uses less than 10 tools? Two, three, okay. Who uses 10 to 50 tools? Should be most, most. Who uses over 50? It happens, it happens. Um, from what I've seen, this is nothing official, I've never sent out a survey, but what I've seen is the average is about 40, 40 tools. I've talked to CISOs that say, CISOs of main big banks and such, that say, all I'm doing is vendor management. That's all I do all day. I go out to lunch, it's night, no. Um, it's doing vendor management, it's taking calls, it's learning about new tools, it's getting the pitches. They're not actually doing security, they're just doing vendor management. Um, that needs to change. What, what can we do about it? Well, everybody's got this problem. It's kind of like the people problem. We also have the too many tools problem. Um, I think everybody has the new shiny, I want to buy one of those problem. I'm not sure how to get over the shiny thing problem besides just say don't do it. Um, but a bigger thing is very limited feature use. So what happens is we buy all these technologies and then we don't implement them fully. We have a legacy firewall, and then we buy this brand new fancy firewall, and we say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use all those features, I'm gonna buy all the subscriptions, I'm gonna do all the things, and then you take your old firewall and you plop all your rules into your new firewall, and then you don't do anything else. And all you've done is upgraded your metal. You're, you have the same security that you did the past five to seven years, except for in a new shiny box. So, this happens over and over and over again. This is one of the big pitfalls I've seen, especially with subscriptions. I've seen people spend $40,000 on a monthly subscription and never turn it on. If the people running the business knew this, they would have a heart attack. But as practitioners, we understand, well, we're busy. We don't have time to learn this new thing or turn it on. Well, you need to make time because it's gonna make you more, more protected. Um, one of the CISOs I work with um, out of the Middle East, he has a rule. If they want to add a new tool into his SOC, they have to take out two. It's a pretty good rule. It's working for him so, hard. It, so far. It makes the employees of the SOC have to work, think a lot harder about what they want, so it takes the luster off of the shiny object problem, um, but it really works for him to reduce the amount of tools. So here's another problem. Extensive vendor management, yeah, you're spending too much time talking to vendors. Um, you have duplicate functionality because you haven't actually turned on all your features. But the other thing, every time you buy a new tool, what, is the, what does the person want you to do? You just have to install this one agent. You just have to put this one more box in your data center. It's just one more thing you have to add. So what happens is you have end user degradation. So your user experience is slower, um, it might be eating you know, the batteries of your, your um, handhelds. It's actually affecting your users for every single one of these tools that you, you buy. So what I predict is gonna happen is there's gonna be a consolidation of platforms. I do not mean a roll-up. I do not believe that when big companies buy all the little startups, that that's a winning strategy. Because I think we've all seen when Really good companies get bought up by bigger companies and maybe it doesn't work out quite right. Um, and that feature, that technology, that innovation kind of dies on the vine. So when I say consolidation on a platform, I do not mean a big company buys up all these little companies. What I mean is that there's gonna be some big players that come out with platforms. And all of the startup companies that we see, all of the fantastic innovation that we see, those are gonna become features of the platform. It doesn't mean they have to be bought by the big company, it just means they become a feature, and so it changes the way that we're consuming technology. It's changing the way that we're, we're only having to install one agent because all of our features use the same data anyway, so let's have one agent, it pulls in all the data, and then we have all these features that can act on it. So I think that that's the way that it's gonna move. Um, we've already started to see some of the, the players do this, um, and it's gonna help us with our our other problems of vendor management, et cetera. So we want 
less tools, we want more features. That's the goal. But, 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 what if I just build my own? I hear this, especially the ones with money. Like, I'm just, I'm just going to build my own platform. I'm going to do this myself. Uh, no, this doesn't work. Um, there was a large customer down, not, when I say customer, I don't mean my customer, I mean somebody that I've spoken with, down in Australia who's spent two years and about $20 million, and it didn't work. And they said, oh, never mind. It was a fantastic idea. They had all the right knowledge to do it. They just couldn't do it. So high cost, low results. Don't try to do it yourself. Um, there's one exception. I've seen a, another different energy company who is building their own. But what they've done is they've, they are one that has bought every product on the market. And then when they build their own, they're building all the integrations of all those different products. My guess is that most of you in this room don't have the budgets or the time to do that. Um, so when you say, I'm just going to build my own, don't. It doesn't work. OK, side note of cloud, switching topics to cloud. Um, this isn't a fully sock message, but everybody has questions about cloud. So here's some things that I'm seeing in cloud. Um, everybody's very, very cautious. The first year is usually really, really slow. Um, these are the three big players, Microsoft, Amazon, and, and Google. There's a couple others, but these are the three that are really coming out a lot. The big guys that I know are on their second, third, fourth iterations. The first time they always say, I'm just going to lift and shift. I'm just going to take all of my current applications, I'm going to throw them on cloud, and then I'm going to fix them later. It doesn't work. And so if you're planning your cloud journey and you say, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pick them up and put them in the, new, in the cloud, mm. so unfortunately it doesn't work that way. Um, you're going to have to take the time to change the way applications work for the cloud. Here's the other thing is that if, if something was insecure and junky before cloud, it's going to be insecure and junky in cloud. So you have to do that changeover. You have to add in that security before it's, it's actually going to work. So that's what I've seen there. There's also a lot of regulation challenges that people are trying to figure out. The bigger ones are going to have to figure that out for the smaller guys because we don't have time. We don't have the money to figure that out. So it's ever evolving. As far as protections, um, the big, the big players, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, have made it pretty clear about what they protect and what they don't. Um, read the fine print of your, your contracts. But basically, they protect their infrastructure. You protect all of your data in it. You protect all of the traffic flows to and from it. They protect their data center. You protect everything else. So data coming to and from um, the cloud, the data in the SaaS applications that you're using, all of the user controls. That's on you. Um, so when they say, oh, I'm going to buy the secure cloud, no, you're going to buy a cloud that is secure on its own. And once you put your stuff into it, that's your problem. So just keep that in mind. Um, the other thing is that prevention-based architecture, the zero trust model, if you get that right in your network, when you move it over to cloud, it's still going to work. So a lot of times people say, well, I don't want to do, I don't want to do this zero trust model until I move to the cloud, because I don't want to have to redo it. You don't have to. So do it now, and then you can move it to the cloud as your business moves. So number six, um, there was pre-target, there's after-target. <laughs> there's pre the business really caring, and now the business really cares. Um, so working with the business is something I've seen change a lot over the last five years or so. Uh, one of the big things is sock knock integration, but not physically. <laughs> Do not put them in the same room. Um, but it's, it's more of the, the sock finds something bad. You have to work with the network to go fix it, block it, prevent it, so that they don't see it again in the sock. This works for bigger companies, smaller companies. The sock is still an island, unfortunately. And I don't mean small companies, I mean medium sized companies. Unfortunately, the SOC is still an island, so that's something that we have to continually uh, break down. I have seen an increase of SOCs, um, CISOs, reporting directly to a CEO. 
So that's interesting. You know, 15 years ago, it was the security always reported to IT, which was conflict of interest. It's bad uh, because then the security people say, well, we need to fix this, and the IT person says, no, 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 that'll take my network down, and so you have an issue. So it's changed over the years to the CISO reports to uh, risk and compliance, or they report to audit, or they report to the COO. Um, anyway, so that's how things have changed, but I've actually seen them report to the CEO now. So it'll be interesting how that plays out. Um, business unit alignment. Something that I've seen people do is instead of buying an analyst, you buy, you buy. Instead of hiring a new analyst, you hire a business liaison. So this person's gonna figure out what sort of controls do we need on the business? Why do we keep saying no and the business keeps saying, I hate you, let me do what I want? Um, and so they've actually found a lot of uh, benefit from hiring that business liaison instead of just another analyst. Um, other things are automation developers and operations en engineers. So not just the process, not just figuring out the processes and engineering within the SOC, but finding it between, especially with cloud, working with those developers. What do they need? What sort of templates do they need to be able to spin up their uh, virtual environments quickly and securely? Um, so investing in those as opposed to just the pure analyst. Um, you know, I forgot to mention before too, is with the people problem. A lot of times people say, well, I'm just gonna use an MSS. They have the same people problem we do. So if you're thinking about using an MSS, just keep that in mind. A managed security provider, they may have the same people problems that you do. Um, anyway, so the automations and operations engineers kind of help if you are working with an MSS, figuring out those processes between them and you. And like I said, um, small businesses are still on an island. I have seen organizations where they run reports and they say, here's all the applications that you're running. Go deal with it. They're never going to deal with it. You just gave them, you're the traffic cop, you just gave them a report and they're never going to do anything. So that, um, that operations engineer can figure out those processes to make sure that you lock down those applications or you strictly allow those applications so you're not wasting your time on that anymore. So one more big topic, metrics. I love metrics. I hate metrics and I love metrics all at once. Um, the right metrics drive change. And unfortunately, our metrics suck. They are terrible. They have been forever. Um, and so I'm trying to push what I've learned into what's what are terrible metrics and what are good metrics. And the biggest thing is you have to ask yourself, can I do anything with the data that I'm providing? It's the so what. You give, you give a number, hey, today we're a 42. So what? Is that better? Or like, what are you gonna do with that information? So you always wanna have metrics that mean something. So here are terrible metrics. And number one, everybody has, because the business likes to see it, because security grew out of IT, and IT cares about how fast can you get the network back up, how fast can you do things, and so we've inherited mean time to resolution, mean time to response. It's terrible, it drives the wrong behavior. Because what you're doing is you're telling your analysts, how fast can you get this, how fast can you close it? How fast can you select all and delete? How fast can you close this ticket, which is not what we want them to do? That does not make the business more secure. So mean time to resolution is terrible. Um, number of incidents handled is kind of one of those, so what? So I did, I did 16. So what? If there were 200, then that's terrible. If there were 16, then that's fantastic. So number of incidents by itself doesn't matter. Um, number of alerts. Maybe you turned on a new sensor and so now you've doubled your alerts. That, that, that by itself just doesn't mean anything. And number of feeds, like I said, I got 50 feeds coming into my sock. Who cares? If you're not doing anything with it, then it doesn't matter. And a note on red, yellow, green. I hate red, yellow, green. Here's why. If you show your board, hey, today we're green, you should never tell them you're green. 
You are never, you should never be comfortable that you're not gonna get attacked tomorrow. This is a false sense of security. If you say, oh, we're only at a yellow. Oh good, I can go home and sleep tonight. No, you have no idea what's gonna happen tomorrow. So a red, yellow, green is misleading, and I don't think that we should use those for overall security of our companies. So what does work? This is my, my rant, I love this. Um, there's two types of metrics. I think all metrics should fit into these. There's configuration confidence, which, which is what is my confidence that my technology, my controls are up and running, that are configured to best practice, and are operating as I intend them to operate. So that's one set of configuration. I'm confident in my configuration of controls. The other is I'm confident in my operations of those controls. Do I have the people in place? Do I have the processes in place? Can I actually use the technology that I have up and running? Because ultimately the business doesn't care about number of feeds or number of alerts. They want to care, they care about what's the threat? Am I affected? How big is it? And when's it gonna be fixed? That's what they care. They don't care about number of alerts that came in today. So what are some examples? Configuration confidence, are my controls running? So this is really hard. So you, you go out and you install a bunch of firewalls, you install a bunch of um, endpoint protection, and then somebody needs to make a, cha a change in this corner of your network, and so they turn off the firewall, or they turn off some rules on the firewall, and then they forget to turn it back on. And it's really hard to actually know that that happened. It's hard to track that. Um, so our controls are running. That's something that we have to lock down. We have to, just because we installed it doesn't mean it's running. Um, figure out what's been changed, especially in cloud. So there's um, configuration drift, and so we need to figure out. We started out at this point, and 48 hours later, it, it got someplace else. We need to know about those. Are we configured to best practices? If not, why? That's fine. Feature use. So if we're only using 5% of our features, which by the way, I did an audit on a customer and they were using 5% of the technology that they had bought, um, we need to know that. You know, you bought this technology, go and use it and be able to measure it. And ask your vendors to, make, to tell you. Like, hey, I bought your endpoint solution. Am I using it right? How much of it am I using? Um, ask them to figure that out for you. And then percent of traffic visible. So if 70, 80% of our network is encrypted, how much of it can we see? Are we using SSL decryption? Can we not because of certain regulations? We need to know these things to be able to run the business and have a sense of, am I confident that I can handle an attack? Which is where the operational confidence comes in. This is, I'm going to be attacked, I'm going to. I don't know if it's tomorrow, I don't know if it's next week, it's probably continuous. Operational confidence is can you handle it when it happens? So a couple of metrics around that. Events per analyst hour. This is like the, uh, the holy grail of, oh, of the um, of SOC metrics. Because this means if, if events per analyst hour is too high, your analysts are overwhelmed, they're gonna miss things, they're gonna delete things. If it's too low, then you can give them extra work to do. Never mind. It's never too low. Um, but events per analyst hour is probably 13. 13 is kind of what you're driving towards. And that's an extremely hard number to get to, but that's, that's where you can be confident that the analyst can handle something that comes in. Duplicate incidents. If you see the same incident coming in over and over and over again, that means there's a problem in your controls. That you're not, your, your closed loop process is broken because it's not actually closing the loop. Um, alerts for known threats. Your controls should always be preventing known threats. You should never see those coming into a SOC. Um, and then deviation from SOC procedures. If you have these procedures in place and people keep moving step five over here, there's two, there's two problems that this could indicate. One is education. People just aren't using the processes correctly. Two, your processes are terrible and they need to be rewritten. So those are things that are actually gonna help you be confident that you can protect the business. So just a quick recap. So what's working if people do it right? 
Um, Well-defined mission and scope. Identify, investigate, mitigate, period. We want to do noise reduction in the SOC. Um, how do we do that? Well, prevention-based architectures we've, we've seen work. Prevent it before it even gets to the SOC. Um, automate the mitigation if you have the confidence to do so. Um, if you can do all that, then attempt hunting. Don't say you're going to do hunting just because it sounds cool and you need an extra challenge on a, a Friday afternoon. If you're going to do hunting, formalize it. Do it right. Um, full utilization of existing tools. So make sure that what you paid for, your subscriptions are tar turned on, you're actually blocking, you're not just alerting. Um, make sure that you're using your tools that you've bought. Try to get a more business focus. Sometimes this is hard. If you work in a small organization, sometimes you are on that island. So you gotta you got try to work on that. But the tighter you are at the business, the more you can not just say no and actually work with them on solutions. Um, one of the people I know that's on their fourth iteration of cloud, what they've done is they've worked with the business to say, here's our preferred cloud vendor. Here's all the services you can get from this particular cloud vendor. And I know that developers are going to want some feature over here, and they can do that too, but it's going to be hard. OK? At least they worked with the business to come up with a solution. So they don't have to fully uh, support two clouds, two uh, cloud vendors. They have one that they support and one that they have as, as extras. So next week, define the mission of your SOC. Make sure it's defined and short in scope. And make sure that the business actually buys into it. Because if, if you just say, this is what we do, but they expect you to do this, that's not going to matter. So make sure they buy into it. Second is question all your metrics. See if you can actually change people away from MTTR. It's going to be hard, but you can do it. Um, make sure that your metrics are actually telling you if you can withstand an attack or not. Because that's really what we're here to do, is figure out, can you find it? Can you limit it? We're not going to prevent an attack, but you need to be able to prevent it spreading in your network and actually exfiltrating data that you need. So preventing successful cyber attacks is our goal. Um, evaluate your tool set, use your features. In the next six months, try to go towards that zero trust model, that prevention-based architecture. If you can do that, then move towards hunting. And if they'll let you, hire, hire a, a business liaison. Move those controls closer to what actually matters to the business, because it's usually not what we think it is. So hopefully, this has given you some nuggets of information you can take back. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, but I'll be around if you guys have questions. And uh, I thank you guys for your time. You mean as far as a third-party provider of hunting? Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of it. I, I've heard about it, but I haven't actually seen it myself. So I can't tell you if it's a good idea or bad. Um, in theory, I think it would be good, because then you don't have to hire the, the skills. But yeah, but I haven't actually seen it myself, so I can't answer. <laughs> So I think if, mostly. So what, what I've seen in machine learning and AI is, so my, my theory is you don't have to be perfect. You have to be better than the analyst. You just have to be better than the human. Um, so, it's, so that's why I'm saying, yes, it can be successful, because you don't have to be perfect. Um, what I have seen is um, 
some of the machine learning AI that's trying to replace that first line analyst, some are actually very good. And you can actually run them in parallel with, you can actually run through 30 days of your old data and compare what the machine found against your analyst and, and figure out if your analysts are better or if the machine's better. And so you can go with that. Yes. 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 It's possible. And I've seen, yeah. We can talk later about some tools that I've seen that are effective. Yeah. And, and I've only seen, so here's why I don't want to say, hey, this is the best tool ever, because I've only seen a, a small amount of socks in the world. And I've seen certain things work for certain socks, so we can talk about that later. <laughs> yes. Be, data breach with the vendors? <sighs> That's all in your contracts. I mean, there's no automated way to handle all of that. Um, it's all in your processes, if I'm getting your question right. So the, the way to handle the breach is to make sure that you have the right processes with your vendors. Is that what you're asking? Do we have any what? A technical way. <sighs> Not that I've seen. So uh, yes, because you're monitoring. Uh, you, you can monitor you know, what data is flowing back and forth, what data is flowing to that vendor. Maybe you work with an MSSP. But then you're basically doubling the amount of work. So you're not trusting them. Um, so I think the only way to do it technically is to double, you know, you're monitoring them, they're monitoring you, and that's kind of a waste. Um, maybe we can talk later and we'll see if I can get a better answer for you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you guys for your time. <laughs>